All right, welcome everyone to OSS Summit. Uh, this is the Exotic Runtimes talk. Um, I have a list of keywords up here, and I'm curious which keywords have brought the most people here today. Um, I'm going to guess that it is probably this one more than anything. I may be wrong. Uh, can we get a show of hands? Who's using Kubernetes? Okay, that's good. Uh, who's using GitOps already? Most of you, cool. And who is actually using Ruby? A uh, couple, all right. Uh, how about uh, Ruby and Wasm together? No, not yet. Uh, what about, um, who's building a Kubernetes operator? We've got one, two, cool. Kubernetes operator with Ruby? No, didn't think so, okay, cool. Someone tell me that these were original thoughts that I put together and I thought that was cool, so I wanted to know uh, a couple things from the audience. All right, so uh, I already established nobody was here yesterday, but uh, yesterday I presented this as a lightning talk. Today I get to slow down a little bit and we can talk about some things that uh, there wasn't really space for in a 15 minute session. Um, so that's cool. I'm not gonna assume that anyone has already seen the session from yesterday. So I'll repeat most of that stuff uh, today. So this is me. I'm Kingdon Barrett. I am a Flux maintainer. Um, you can find me on these social media platforms. And I'm a YouTuber. Um, I am a uh, open source support engineer at Weaveworks in the developer experience uh, department. And I work on Flux, um, mostly in a community capacity, but I've also been had my hands in the code as a Flux v1 maintainer, and I'm trying to contribute where I can to the code of Flux v2. Uh, I have a weekly event that's called the Flux Bug Scrub, where you can find me um, and other Flux maintainers if you want an audience with a Flux maintainer, if you have issues that you'd like to have addressed that they sat in the queue, you can reach us directly and talk to us face-to-face -face on a Zoom meeting. Um, and it's, it's the forum for it. Like, we have a regular dev meeting also, but um, okay. So uh, as an open source support engineer, I am focused almost entirely on open source. Big surprise. And I lean into open source solutions as much as I can. Um, we have other presentations also uh, here at GitOpsCon related to Flux. If you scan this QR code, you can find out about all of them. Um, and just a little bit more about me. Uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, these are the types of things that you'll find there. Um, one of the things that you will find there is me live coding a Kubernetes operator in Ruby this morning um, to show off my WASM bits. So, okay, so what are we here for today? WASM and Ruby, I think, primarily. And what is untrusted code and why do we want to run it? Uh, well, I will tell you a secret, I do not trust any code. Uh, that's, that's probably false. If you look at what I do from day to day, I'm probably trusting lots of code. But in a sandbox, uh, you, you, that's what WASM is built around, is a sandbox that is for running untrusted code, uh, which is very helpful if you are on a web browser or if you're on a server. Um, so we're primarily going to focus on a server today. And I had a question when I started preparing for this talk was, can you run uh, Ruby in WebAssembly? Because that was what it seemed was on the tin. And it turns out, yes, you can, uh, but I'm not sure that there's really a good reason to do this, at least in a server context. Um, so uh, we'll, get, we'll get back around to that. But why WebAssembly? Um, so it, we want to build on a secure foundation. Uh, if you haven't heard of the Bytecode Alliance, they have a great page where you can read all of the details about why WebAssembly. Uh, for me, portable artifacts, that is what I'm after, and I would like to have language independence. Uh, I cannot sell you on WASM. If you do not know why you need it, it's going to be a tough talk. Um, if you take it with you, I will get nothing. There's no commission. Uh, I don't know how WASM makes their money, um, but let's find out together. Okay, so why Kubernetes? Uh, for me, the answer is I'm a Flux maintainer and you have to have Kubernetes to run Flux on it. Uh, so 
If you chose Kubernetes, you probably already know why you did. Uh, but if you haven't or you're thinking about it, this is a really brief summary of Kubernetes and GitOps together. You have declarative, versioned, immutable artifacts that describe your desired state. And your infrastructure is self-healing. It's constantly reconciling on a path towards putting those things uh, towards your desired state, the way you described it. So uh, these are some compiled languages that you can put into Rust uh, WebAssembly modules. And if you are not interested in Ruby at all, I promise there will be some value for you here today as well. So uh, here's a little bit about my history as a Rubyist. I have been using Ruby for a very long time, thanks to a friend on the internet who helped introduce me uh, a long time ago. And uh, I um, also, at my first permanent job, was primarily focused on building Ruby things. We used a lot of other languages, VBScript, various things, uh, uh, probably more shell script even than anything else. My second permanent job, I was really focused on Ruby and Ruby on Rails, and uh, I was an application developer there with a lot less responsibility. Uh, better pay, though. So um, for me, why Ruby? I know it better than any other language. And for you, whatever language you're choosing, that's probably the language you want to use because you know it well. Um, for me, the benefits of Ruby, comfort and familiarity, debugging experience, can't be beat. Bundler handles gems, dependencies wonderfully. Um, I haven't found an experience like that in practically any other language. Um, and fibers. Uh, which are relatively new in Ruby, um, they are, are great for concurrency. Uh, so I'm using fibers. Um, minimum, minimum viable product is, is the goal. When you're writing Ruby, you want to write fast. You want to pull in as many dependencies as you can, probably, um, and don't write anything you don't have to write. If it's your core business dependencies, things that you really need to know inside and out, you probably want to write it yourself at least once. But once you know it, you'll probably want to lean on whatever is the best in class library. So, so what are we using Ruby for most of the time? To run a website, I guess, or connect to a database, or scrape some content from an internet, or maybe build an IRC bot, or something like that. Lots of different things you can use Ruby for. Um, there's no compiler. It is duct typed and object oriented. Those things are all great. OK, so why not build a Kubernetes operator in Ruby? Uh, I think that's a great idea. And I'm not the first person. Uh, someone put out a nice library for that. We'll get to that. Um, so WebAssembly in Ruby. Here are your entry points. You can use, these are the things I tried at least, Wasmer and WasmTime. I liked Wasmer a little bit better. I thought their examples were more approachable and more comprehensive. Uh, but I did start with WASM time because that was the runtime that Spin was promoting more heavily first. Um, I, I'll get to Spin also. So what we're going to do with these is run WebAssemblies in Ruby, not run Ruby in WebAssemblies. Um, and what is a WebAssembly? It is a runtime format, a binary format. And it is also, uh, besides being able to run applications as WebAssembly, you can build libraries and include them in other programs, like I said. So if you wanted to bundle Ruby interpreter inside of Ruby, I would suggest that you consider not doing that, because I couldn't think of any benefit, even though that was the first thing I tried. Like I said, I only wanted to use Ruby. I'm not sure why I would use a Ruby in a WebAssembly for Ruby. Um, there's actually, we have a question? I did. Um, well, with Wasmer, I did. Yeah. Um, so uh, there was really no benefit that I could tell uh, other than I won't have to use another language. Um, but for, for uh, various reasons, the top of them probably being the WebAssembly size. Uh, so the Ruby interpreter itself as a compiled WebAssembly is like 30 megabytes. So if you actually intended on distributing these things to people running them in a web browser, you may have made a terrific mistake. Uh, so we're going to try the other thing. And so this is the type of thing that I think WebAssembly users are doing, based on uh, going through all the tutorials. And if these are not the things that you thought you wanted to do, uh, keep, 
keep watching. Hopefully, the, they will make sense as we go on. Um, so you can export functions from your WebAssembly and call them from Ruby, or you can, uh, well, from a language that you run your WebAssembly in. Uh, you can also export functions in the opposite direction or import functions into your WebAssembly so that you can call them um, from inside of your code. That's a nice way out uh, it, from the sandbox if you need to provide a way out, say, for fetching or something like that. And um, the examples were really focused on the use of a compiler, which is kind of the point where I began to infer that maybe this was trying to trick me into using a compiler. Um, so, and then there's the system interface. That's the penultimate example uh, that uh, is, is good for all of the things that you can't easily do in a sandbox. Um, so what is the system interface good for? Input and output, uh, file system, if you wanna import some files uh, so that you can just access them from inside of the WebAssembly, read them from the disk, um, those are system calls. And uh, if you wanna make connections to the outside world in a protected way, there's really no network inside of the WebAssembly itself, but you can still do it with something like WASI. Uh, this is not the only way in, by the way, I should mention, but it's the one we're gonna focus on most today. And there's an extension called WAGI. If you're not familiar with all these buzzwords, maybe you've heard of CGI. Uh, WAGI is like CGI. So you take your standard input output and you put a little header at the top that says this is the content I'm accepting or expecting and it's your connection. You don't have to manage connections now. So that's pretty cool. Um, you just get a request and it comes in standard input. So uh, these are some features that you won't find in WebAssembly directly. There's no string type, that's kind of tough. Especially for Ruby. Um, I found that if I wanted to get a string into WebAssembly, I had to allocate some memory and then keep the length of the string around and I was getting flashbacks to C and I don't, I don't think I want to do that. So uh, I was able to avoid doing that thanks to WASI because we can just pass the string in that way and then parse it and pass the result back out through standard output. Um, so, uh, but as far as actually passing a string to a function, that was the first thing I tried after I tried running Ruby in Ruby and that also did not work for me. So I had to find a different way. What I like to emphasize right now is that all of these constraints, as I found I was running into roadblocks, um, there are other roadblocks I haven't mentioned yet, uh, C extensions was probably the primary one. If you use Ruby gems, most of them don't have a C extension, but probably somewhere in the realm of 10% of them do. Uh, so if you uh, wanted to use Nokogiri, say, to parse some HTML, you might need to find uh, pure Ruby. Uh, if, you, if you were still thinking about bundling your Ruby in the WASM, uh, which I, I suggest you do if you're interested, um, but like I said, we're gonna focus on the other stuff. So. I was trying to aim towards solving a real problem with WASM. Uh, I needed some string params and return values. I would assume I would need those things. Um, okay, so I started with spin, which actually has great docs. And if you're trying to learn WASM for the first time, I suggest that you start there as well. Uh, they will tell you about your language, what level of support there is for that language, what types of things you can do. And there are great examples uh, or links to good examples from there. Um, I did find a nice Ruby example that showed me how to pull in gems, and um, I think that was in the spin kitchen sink. Uh, we'll, we'll look at some of those examples later, but um, so what is spin exactly? It is kind of a serverless framework, and if you know what serverless is, it's kind of not really a thing. It just means we're gonna run some code and then we're gonna shut it down and reclaim all the memory and wait for another request before we use any resources again. Um, so spin is useful for testing locally also. Um, spin itself is running as a server that will, uh, like I said, help you shuttle connections to your uh, process. It kind of behaves like a router. Um, we're not gonna run on Fermion Cloud because that is not open source. Um, but 
we are not going to run on Hippo Factory either because I don't think <laughs> that is a serious idea. And I've already been sold on Kubernetes. And if you're telling me now we need, in addition to Kubernetes, we also need a Hippo Factory, I know you're pulling my leg. So uh, <laughs> Hippo Factory is the open source version of Fermion Cloud. Um, so we're going to use Kubernetes not only because we already have it, but because we want to use Flux. And these are the things that we hope to gain by adopting WebAssembly in whatever shape that finally turns out to look like. Uh, we want to get testability, reusability of our code modules, uh, type safety be between languages, and I'm also going to add in here now uh, smaller payload size. We want our code to be smaller when it goes to the users uh, so that it can launch faster because that is one of the primary goals of WebAssembly if you read all the marketing copy. Um, and also, we want our polyglot teams to be able to work together. If we've got teams that have specializations that depend on the libraries that exist in a particular language, we want them to be able to interact with each other with as little friction as possible. So I did build some things for this talk, and I followed all the examples that I mentioned so far, and uh, let's see what we did. I found a problem that was big enough to require some code to solve, uh, my boss goes to the web page uh, for each of our GitHub packages on GHCR every day. Uh, she doesn't really do it every day, but uh, it takes a screenshot and then feeds it through an OCR and figures out over time how many downloads have we had. I mentioned I work in developer experience, so how many downloads, how many users are important questions for us. And it's one of the few ways that we have to track our users because we don't like tracking users. Many of our users are in an air gap. We know that there are limitations no matter what we do, so this is one of the things we like to know, is how many downloads there are. And plus, it's a really big number, so uh, we, we like to show off big numbers. We like graphs that go up and to the right. So um, what we do is we visit this page, and we see that there is a number there, and there doesn't seem to be an API endpoint for that number, uh, but it's updated in real time. And if you hover the mouse over, you can see somewhere deep in HTML, there is an actual real number, uh, real whole number of downloads you can fetch. Uh, so I built an EKS cluster to run this stuff on. And if you go to this GitHub repo, you can find all about the EKS cluster definition. It's a multi-arch cluster. Um, since we wanted to demonstrate the platform independence. And it bootstraps Flux. Um, onto the cluster uh, as part of EKS. If you've never used EKS Cuddle, it's a really nice tool. I actually used it for the first time, um, well, recently. I'm sure I used it once before, but this is the first time I've used it in Anger. And uh, I deployed some stuff to it. I uh, tried to figure out how to deploy. So all right, forget Ruby. How do we deploy any WebAssembly at all? Let's say we're happy to lean on spin. Um, so I came up with a solution for how to deploy a spin application that existed already uh, called Bartholomew onto uh, Kubernetes via GitOps. And for me, I thought the easiest way would be probably not Helm, but I did decide eventually that Helm would be easy enough uh, because I found this great library to help me build a Helm chart, this library called Helmet. It's uh, basically you write a one-liner in your templates, and then you expand it out with values. You just say what is unique about your deployments and whatever else it needs to depend on inside of values.yaml. How many people are Kubernetes users, by the way? All right, so these might be familiar topics to everyone. Um, so at this point, I began to understand a few things, and it's going to be tough to cover them. Uh, so I won't be able to go into detail about all of those and show the code. I'd rather show the code. but. Um, Fermion, if you know the history of Fermion, who's uh, leading Spin and a, a lot of the Bytecode Alliance stuff, uh, leading the pack there, in, in, at least in my view, um, they're the inventors of Helm. Matt Butcher is the CEO of Fermion, and he invented Helm. And they helped develop Azure Kubernetes service after Deus was acquired by Microsoft. So uh, I, I was pretty miffed when I pulled up all the documentation. I found there was no... Kubernetes example. They didn't show you how to deploy it on Kubernetes at all. But I did become a little more understanding about that when I tried it myself. Uh, it, was, it was painful. 
for a number of reasons. Um, so let's step away from that for a minute. I also built this series of examples uh, moving towards a Kubernetes operator. And the Kubernetes operator has a design to solve this problem where we have a uh, project CRD that has the name Flux CD in it. That project CRD goes to fan out and see how many packages are there in Flux. And then it creates a sub-resource called Leaf for each one of those packages. That sub-resource goes and fetches that page that I was talking about that has the number on it, uh, saves it in a file, passes it to our WASM module, which we'll also talk about. It's inside of this repo. And, and then uh, the WASM module returns the number parsed from the HTML as a string. Since we said string return types was a, a difficult thing, and WASI helps us solve it. This is a proof. Um, so once we've got the number back in Ruby, we parse it, put it back in a number. Uh, we store that number in the CRD status. There's a field defined for the status that says how many downloads count. And, and we'll come back later. We'll build a Prometheus um, exporter so we can scrape this, feed it into Prometheus. We don't want to store this data long term. Uh, but we'd like to have it for a couple of weeks so we can export it regularly and then put it in a spreadsheet. How did I build a Kubernetes operator in Ruby? Well, actually, it was really easy. This project on GitLab is inactive if you look at it, uh, but it's based on a nice library called KubeClient that is actively developed. Um, so with this example, you can read a single page of code. Uh, it's really very minimal code. All it does is it registers whatever CRD that you should be listening to, and then it registers two functions, upsert and delete. It manages your finalizers for you. If you don't know what those things are, I saw, I saw, I asked when uh, we started, but how many people are developing Kubernetes operators? We have more people now than before. More than a few. All right, there's still very few. So these might be really unfamiliar concepts, but the finalizer is the thing in your custom resource that tells Kubernetes, there's something that has to happen before this gets garbage collected. If you get a delete signal, wait for me to come around and remove the finalizer, then clean it up. So um, I wasn't sure what I was going to use that for, but it's common in the operator pattern. And if you've tried to learn the operator pattern, you probably reached for the controller runtime book, which is a bit longer than a page. Uh, this was very approachable. I thought this was a much more easy way Flux is based on the controller runtime. Probably there are a few other uh, controller runtime-like things out there. I'm not going to try to name them, but here's KubeClient, the Ruby library I was talking about. has some nice features, like it uses server-side apply. Uh, if you don't know about server-side apply, that's a, another relatively new feature in Kubernetes that Flux uses. gives you some very nice capabilities, like the ability to wait for the resource that you just created to become ready before you return um, from your, your function call that said create this thing. Uh, and if it fails to become ready or times out or anything else goes wrong, you can get a signal back instead of uh, just assuming asynchronously that it went OK. So even if there's an admission controller or something on the Kubernetes API itself that would prevent that perfectly valid resource from going in, you can get that back as a signal. Uh, and that's great. So if this was the lightning talk, we would be at the end, uh, but we're not. And these are some other talks you'll be able to see. I just want to mention them before we forget and run out of time, because we're going to leave the slides and start looking at code. Uh, so yesterday, when I presented the lightning talk, the operator wasn't finished yet. There is a link. If you download the slides, you'll get a QR code later if you want to download the slides. Um, or you can just go to my YouTube channel and find where I did finish the functional parts of the operator this morning. It actually does work. Uh, hopefully, we'll see it. Um, I wrote it in about three hours total. If you think that sounds fantastic, um, Ruby, man. OK. So this is also, I didn't mention this, but I had to write a Rust app because I said, well, uh, putting Ruby inside of a WASM probably doesn't seem like a good idea. I think it's trying to trick me into a compiler. Maybe I should let it. So I learned a little bit of Rust. I learned how to parse HTML in Rust. This is my first Rust app. We're going to start with that. 
uh, and then we'll work our way back out to see how do you deploy WASM and Kubernetes, uh, which may be what most of you came here for today. And um, we'll come back to this if we don't forget. Oh, crashed. If we can, all right. Okay. So here's that stats tracker repo that I mentioned. I think I want a different, here, this is the better one. Set of tabs. Uh, each of these repos that I linked, by the way, in the slides has a tremendously um, well-developed readme to explain what I was trying to do. Um, a lot of the things that I have explained here today are gone over in more depth here. Things like performance questions, does this actually perform at all, are started to be addressed in here. There are some gaps still in those numbers uh, because, I, like I mentioned, I just finished the operator this morning, so it's tough to collect performance metrics right now. Um, but what I found most of all was the, the fact that I kept being forced to make my problem smaller. Originally, I said, I want to do this all in WebAssembly. I want to do it all in Ruby. And that would have been easy, except for WebAssembly. Um, so each time I found a constraint, I said, OK, we can work around this. My C extension, Nokogiri, there's probably a Gamo uh, pure Ruby library that I can use to parse HTML. Then um, when that didn't actually solve my problem, I said, well, how can we solve it? Uh, let's find another HTML parsing library in Rust. And, and so I did eventually get uh, that to be quite small. Here's a nice graph going up and to the right. Uh, we'll hopefully see some performance numbers in the future. But there, in each of these example directories, there's another readme that shows some of the thought process and some of these things that I found uh, difficult how to walk through them step by step. We're not going to have time for all of that today. But let's actually look at that Rust program that I wrote. Can everybody see this a little bigger? It's good? OK. So uh, in this directory, you can find the Kubernetes operator as well. Um, in the lib folder is most of the code. And if you go into the lib folder, and I'm going to run make clean. Here is a file um, that shows that we are trying to run a WebAssembly in Ruby. Let's look at that. OK, so like I said, I developed this, and I switched it over from Anoko Giri to uh, Gamo. So there are different implementations of current download count in here. They all do basically the same thing. Uh, they start parsing some HTML, and then they use a big hunk and selector. Uh, here's the selector way up here. I was a little bit nervous that the HTML parsers were going to have a hard time as I went to more and more obscure HTML parsers, but none of them had a problem with that big H big CSS selector that was fine. And uh, this is the entry point for whoever is going to call us. They don't care that we're parsing HTML. They really just want to know the current stat and the time together. Um, so we wrap an HTML client because I thought I'd need that. We have a project and a repo and an image, which we'll get from the operator structure that I explained. Um, so we can get all those numbers and collect them. And we'll call this. Uh, like this. So let's make sure that Rust library actually works. Oops, cargo not found. Oh, no. Wait, I know what to do. There. OK, so it's doing a few things. First, it is um, compiling with Cargo. It already has the dependencies, so that's pretty quick. It then strips the WASM module that spits out. So we're using this target, WASM32 WASI. So the compiler knows about WASI. Um, and the strip makes the WebAssembly much smaller. Uh, then WASM opt. Um, 
I found that in a guide. I'm honestly not exactly sure what that does, but I think it uh, is optimizing. I think that's what that stands for. And then running Ruby, we see we actually do get the output we were expecting from the Ruby app uh, with our number that came from Rust, and it's been parsed, and there it is. If we run it again, we would see it is, in fact, a different number. That number changes every time. So there are people, well, not every time, but there are people downloading Flux all the time. OK, so that's cool. Um, let's look a little bit more of the code. So how do we get our operator to run? And let's point at a cluster so this actually works. So there's a CLI, uses Thor. This is really simple. Let's look at lib CLI so we see how that works. Uh, Thor lets you define commands like, I want CLI controller to do something. And let's say we wanted it to run with a different organization than Flux CD, we could pass it in here. I wasn't going to do that. But uh, all right, so this is also very simple code. We can delete some stuff that we didn't use. Um, I thought I would need a loop or something, but that's not how the Kubernetes operator gem works. This is it. So fiber, scheduler, basically this just makes sure that these two parts can run in parallel. So they're not really running in parallel. Ruby is a single-threaded language, but they do have capability to understand when the system calls wait and uh, send the execution to another fiber so that we can run these things together. So that's cool. So let's see if that works. Um, OK, use local cube config. What we see here, I'm going to scroll back up because it's moving really fast. We've got our two fibers running. Trigger action for Flux CD. It found the Flux CD um, resource that had already been created on the cluster. Let's see that resource. It looks like it's doing some stuff. It looks like it's working. So that top level resource is called project. See, we've got one here. And we see that it has an empty status. Don't know why. We'll, we'll see why in a minute. Um, I wasn't really interested in the project status. I wanted to see the status on the leaves. So, and I, like I said, I had limited time. So let's look at those leaves. So it did fan out and find all those packages. Uh, there's a piece of code we didn't see in lib called project reconciler. That does that all in Ruby. I don't need those things to happen in parallel. It's, it's just one fetch to find all that stuff. So I thought that would be fine to leave it this way. Um, we can delete all of these resources as long as we make sure that operator is running. It needs to clean up the finalizers, like I said. Let me get that. And we need this to be comparable size so you can see. So what we should see is it's receiving delete events and it's removing finalizers one after another. This is great. This was super slow in my hotel Wi-Fi. It's working great here. So they all got deleted successfully. Uh, project. OK, delete project. Flux CD. That one can also get deleted. I just want to show you all that we can do it again, and it should work. And it's actually going to run the WASM module, and we'll see the current values. Um, so this is not a finished operator. There's a list of check, check marks on that front page readme that all the things I had intended to do. And I, it's really more important that I get up here and show some working code, I think. So uh, all right, so we create the controller. And here's what happens when there are no projects and no leaves. It starts the operator, and it registers uh, those functions that we set. And there's no log output. So then we can go to 
Kubernetes operator. So here's the code for that Kubernetes operator. By the way, this comes from uh, here, GitLab. And there's no license in this code. I wish that I was able to get in touch with this fellow. I, I sent him a couple of emails to just let him know that I was using it, and I really appreciated that he made it. Uh, but just to be forewarned, there is actually no license in this code. Um, I assumed it was on GitLab, so it was okay to fork it. Uh, but you may, your mileage may vary, I'm not sure. I just asked nicely. If you ask me to take it down, I will. Um, okay, so in the examples directory, here's the example operator. This is a lot more approachable than the one I tried to build because it only reconciles one resource. But you can see this is a page. It's not complicated. You register your CRD. And then you uh, create, you know, you create a Kubernetes operator from the object, and you tell it what CRD it's supposed to listen to. Uh, you attach it to, to a logger, and then uh, there's some event helper. I'm not sure what that's for. Um, and uh, you register the upsert and delete method, and then you run it, and that's it. And that's what we did in our two fibers. Each one gets run. If you pass, uh, follow the execute, execution path, you'll find that run method getting called. Um, are we? Uh, close to time, I think I have, I'm not over time, got five minutes, four, okay, great. All right. So in the example directory, there's a manifest directory. Uh, this also, if you're using controller runtime, it will help you generate your CRDs. This does not help you generate your CRDs. So if you go into, there's two example CRDs. This is a really basic CRD definition and it's, just slightly adapted, and, and here's what I wanted to show you, uh, the properties on the status. So this is why our status message, if you find the status message in the code, didn't actually get reflected because I changed the CRD definition. There's no message field in our status properties. So there's count and last update. That's what I thought we should keep track of on both CRDs. So on the next CRD, this, this one at the top is our projects. That's our Flux CD. And then at the bottom is leaves. Those are uh, customized controller, source controller, all of the various microservice components of Flux and anything else that we've published as a package, like the Flux CLI. Um, some required fields. So there are the three parameters that I mentioned uh, get passed into the um, scaffold for the uh, WASM module. And then here we have count and last update again. Let's make sure we run it before we're out of time. Okay, so here we see triggering some actions. All right, it's doing some stuff. We are gonna see some errors in here. I haven't tested every single resource, but we are gonna see also, um, it's adding events for each one. It looks like it's processing most of them without errors. I got a couple 409s. I don't know what that's for. Okay. All right, so it's created all these leaves. That's great. How many downloads does the Flux CLI package have? Fifty-seven million. Thanks, Wasm. That's okay. Uh, let's see, what else was I gonna show? We have two minutes. I wanna make sure you know about this directory. This is where Flux is bootstrapped into by EKS Cuddle. And in this, here we have examples. Some of these things I depended on. I'm not gonna name each of them. Um, I had hoped to show you scaling to zero with Kata, but the operator itself is not gonna scale to zero. Uh, and then taking Bartholomew. I think we're not gonna get to actually run this deployment, but I do wanna make sure that you know uh, that this also has uh, dedication here from my wife, Catherine. I'm going to help her build a blog. Uh, we've tried this before, didn't always work out. I think this one is gonna stick. Um, do we have any questions? We have a question. Uh, for me, I was not able to get there. For me, what I need to do is actually package the spin runtime in a multi-arch container image and then deploy that with Helm. And from there, pull 
the WASM module uh, using one of the tools. So there are two tools that are available for that. Flux has its own OCI artifact feature, and um, there's Flux build artifact and Flux push, push artifact, which I'm familiar with because I work on Flux. And then I found a similar feature was added in the spin. Uh, I'm not sure if it's spin push artifact, but it it's, works exactly the same way, and it's for packing up your WASM modules and then pulling them down at runtime. So that's, that's pretty much how this works. Um, and if you go in and see the Docker file, let's look at the Docker file. This is really simple. Here we're just downloading spin 1.0. And there's a platform script to detect which spin platform. This is a multi-arch container uh, build. So if you look at the Google, not Google, GitHub workflows, here's our consolidated build. And it builds using buildx. So we get multi-arch image out that we can run our WASM module wherever we need to go. So um, no, I don't see it's going to replace right away, but maybe long term. There is a tool called KWASM operator. If you go look at that, that is going to use a field called runtime class that you probably didn't know was in deployment and pod. Uh, and that runtime class allows you to actually replace your image with some other thing than a Docker container. It can be a WASM module, and then it'll get run by whatever binary you pass in. So KWASM operator is not for production. Um, right now, if you look at the readme, it says right on the front, not for production, because it uses a privileged um, access to put that spin binary in place so that container D can use it. Uh, but I think we're out of time. Do we have any more questions? Okay, thanks. Thank